And when I saw Wenlock Abbey eventually, which was for sale, it was a question of, you know, one of those moments in my own personal history, which is a moment of what I call cadoing. I saw Wenlock Abbey and it said, good afternoon, I am your destiny, I will ruin you. And so it went on to do. Every year that has gone by, I've grown happier in my life. And I'm very glad that God has allowed me to find this place. I looked for it for over a year. All that mattered to me was that it should be within a certain distance of London, approximately 150 miles or 160 miles. This house is 154, I think. And this was the best of quite a number of houses I saw which were within my purse and in this, within this radius. All of the practical repairs have now been done for some years. But remember, I've been here for a quarter of a century. And for many of those years, I have been accompanied by workmen. I still am to some degree. And in the early days, we lived upstairs and could perceive dimly through a plastic sheet, which was erected to save us from the dust, workmen working away from the earliest moment in the day. Dust was everywhere, and we slowly advanced behind this plastic sheet as they completed the floor on which we were. An enormous amount of work was required here, but all done at a pace which I could financially afford. I don't buy larger houses to use them for anything. What I would rather have are empty rooms, uh, gradually filled with precious objects and beautiful things through which I wander alone. Sometimes here even, in these relatively small circumstances of Wenlock Abbey, and I'm alone here and that neither Jane nor Gabriella are here, I walk through these rooms saying aloud with utter pleasure, completely that, that sense of self-endorsement, when you know you've done the right thing, I say aloud here, I am happy. Louis de Vette, you are happy. And I am. The only thing I regret <clears throat> is not having Windsor Castle. I was born in South Africa and I grew up in an atmosphere of acrimony, of economic failure on the part of my father and mother, and of argument in the midst of economic despair, and surrounded by the tragic triviality of bad taste and everyday misery. I took refuge from my family, its grinding poverty, post-defeat in the Boer War poverty, in the rejection of all of it and the beginnings of an almost monastic life of self-disciplinary rules which I made up for myself and it was in this atmosphere in which I began painting. I then a little while after that managed to get a scholarship to university and sent myself to university earning my living as a waiter and broke off from my family entirely. I rejected all they stood for and eventually went to Paris to continue my painting, my studies in painting. Living in the sort of poverty I had to live in then, I came from South Africa to France with a five-year visa to study French and painting in Paris with nine pounds a month given to me by three unknown South African businessmen. I learned very little about painting in Paris, but learned a great deal about life. And I discovered the Louvre, 
And I realized that when I was in the Louvre, that was the future for me. That was where I should study. We have tried to repair and conserve wherever possible, and we've never, I don't think, done any speculative recreation. Um, where we've had to make new elements, they've been based on very careful archaeological uh, forensic examination of what might have been there, and then we've set out to create something which is new and which is legible as a new contribution and not, not something that is certainly not a pastiche or, a, or a, you know, it has been something absolutely relevant to, to, to today singular act of creation that's taken place here, very much of, um, of its time and of its day, um, but very, very deeply personal. And that is relatively rare. And in some ways, poverty is a great preserver because things don't get changed. But everything here has been done with a great deal of care, not with lavish amounts of, of money, but with a huge amount of love and care. And I think that's relatively rare and a great deal of persistence and passion. So if something isn't quite right, it's done again and again and again and again until it is seen to be appropriate and, um, and, and worked on. What do you think? I do. I, 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 I'm not sure that the, the mechanical panelling has been a successful solution. Agreed. Um, I, I agree. I mean, it's... It... Oh, yes, I could not have done it without my admirable architect, who has been a warm friend who has had the deep tact and diplomacy to stay that little bit distant from me, that what the French call une distance hygienique, a hygienic distance from me, and yet has been a loyal co-worker on the Abbey, whose advice has been, been invaluable, and whose knowledge of ancient houses, which are his speciality, has been very profound. His taste also is extraordinary. There is a plaque upstairs of the first group of workmen to work here, each with his trade next to him on this oaken plaque, which I had carved. And below, when I had it carved through Andrew Arrell, the architect, he knew technicians who carved, without telling me he put below all the list of the people who'd worked on it, including his own name as architect, and then below that, he simply put the phrase, his cost and joy. I couldn't think of a better phrase below it than that. I could not think of a better. To this day, I, I really do take my hat off to what he's done there at, at, at the Abbey. I mean, the commitment and the, the level of quality of work that he's uh, uh, done, he's really saved the building. Because if you, if you saw the Abbey uh, in 1983, it was virtually derelict. Once I understood the sheer mass of timbers, the sizes of bulks that Devet wanted to be used for the screen. The ramifications of how that would affect the making, the designing of the joints, the shrinkage, all of these technical difficulties have to be overcome to eventually arrive with a screen that's going to satisfy Devet. And the burden and responsibility of that is enormous because you're taking it on years in advance to you ever finding out what the end result's going to be. And there's always those unknowns and how are you going to overcome those difficulties and stage and step by step. But what is fantastic is the support that I've had from Devet all the way along. The trust that he places 
in, in you as a, a craftsman compels you to meet that with the same and equal response. And that's quite unusual. You, you don't often meet that. And I think that, well, I know that that comes from his own struggle as an artist. He, he is fully appreciative, although it's different, although I'm making something in oak, you know, it's, it's not that different to the same challenges that he faces in, in his painting. The history of the Priory at Wenlock is lost in the mists of time. The past recedes from us every day by one day more. And as it does so, as it recedes, so so-called facts become surrounded in legend and legend replaces facts. So none of this actually necessarily ever happened. The first nunnery we know of was the first establishment here, which was established by Merwald, Saxon king of the area, and he had a daughter called Milberger, who was given the lordship over this area and she dominated it right up into the 7th century. After that, there is a long silence, which included incursions by the Vikings, who came down from Scandinavia and depredated this whole area, burning and raping and pillaging. It was a time of turbulence and largely without history. After this long and more or less legendary past, the Norman conquest came and the lands of Wenlock were given to the great Norman noble Roger de Montgomery and he was made regent of Normandy. He had a very comely wife and he took this beautiful Saxon wife he had with him to Cluny to meet Hugues de Seymour and to ask him to extend the benefit of the Cluniac order as far as Wenlock and later further as far as Paisley in Scotland. And Hugh agreed to this. Cluny was one of the great monastic orders and in the 14th century, in the 1300s, had more than 350 monasteries under it throughout Western Europe. Wenlock therefore became one of the abbeys under the aegis of Cluny. We're talking in terms of the story of Devet's life. Well, the, the degree of difficulty just goes through the roof, but it becomes a lot more exciting to follow a tradition, but in a very contemporary way. I'm carving things on here that have never been carved before. Really, it's a, it's a fabulously new and exciting lunatic project in, in the nicest possible way. It's, it's a job which woodcarvers never get. This screen tells briefly and in part the story of my life. It's believed that there was a screen here. What the screen looked like we don't know. We discovered that this floor was in fact on two levels. When originally I bought the Abbey, more than 25 years ago, this was one level. There was no screen here. It was one level and it was filled with middle-class floral furniture. And the altar was respectfully and discreetly covered by a curtain. And people used this as a sitting room. I have no respect for such things. 
or if you like, I have a greater respect. I wanted to put it back as it was, and I have a respect for that. I don't have plans like most people do, which I map out ahead, etc. I map them out at certain cardinal points in the evolution, which are not themselves prescribed or defined ahead. I play it by ear. I do it as it proceeds. And <clears throat> from time to time I consult the architect and we work things out and think, oh Christ, this has gone wrong and let's do that and that to set it right and I hope it looks okay and let's try it. Well, these designs here in the arch itself are derived from next door, from the ruins, and they come from that. If I'd done this about 1950, it would look better now. Because this oak here, which is very fine oak indeed, uh, is going to age over many, many centuries and look wonderful, but I shall never see it. It'll mean that I'm never totally content. Never. But I've been very privileged to live here and to be the person who is the... Uh, set it all in motion, which I like to think I have done. And I've just got to leave it to itself at a certain point. And just hope that future generations take some care of it. And we don't have a lot of people, soldiers, whose uniform we don't recognise, tramping their way through it. Which could very easily happen. Um, the Chinese or some other power as yet unrecognised people's army who come through here speaking an alien tongue which none of us understand and uh, pushing the pillars aside or trying to I can just imagine The work in the chapel as a complete scheme in that room is, is absolutely extraordinary. I don't know anything like that in any other house. Yes, there are plenty of you know, interesting interior schemes being created in both new houses and alterations of, of old, but this is a, a deeply personal work of art involving many different disciplines, which he's masterminded. It is site-specific uh, in the sense that it's, um, some of the carvings and, and motifs are derived from observation in, in, the, in the Priory buildings and, and obviously it's, it's uh, autobiographic in terms of his, his own life experience and these, these, these extraordinary scenes on the capitals are, are just that, autobiographical notes really. And I think they're great because they are, um, they're, they're just like those things that you see if you go around a, a medieval cloister. So, okay, you will recognise the scenes because they're Old Testament scenes and we, we know what the stock scenes are, whether it's Cain and Abel or you know, some Abrahamic scene or other. Um, so you, you need to know a bit about his life to understand the scenes, but they're arranged in the same sort of way. Um, they, they, they have a sort of magnetism, that when you look at them, you want to know what they are. And the fact that they're cut very deep, which is a particular calming technique we have um, wanted to use, and the scenes run around all four sides of every capital, um, that's very much um, a kind of spatial experience you get in, in, in churches of the 11th, 12th century. Um, where carving exists to be seen in narrative form. So these are, you know, probably deeply unfashionable at the moment, but uh, narrative carvings like that are, is exactly what they are. And they, they are relevant here and they do actually make sense here. If the nation wants to preserve these great houses, then they do, they are expensive to maintain. And that's really where one's got to, to hand it to, to Vett and Gabriella, because they've, you know, they've taken on a massive challenge and they haven't shirked... Um, any part of it. I mean, it, whether it's been the underground rainwater uh, um, water pipes, or the you know the boundary walls, or the archaeology, or the trees, or the dam, the pool, the bridge, all the various everything's been looked at bit by bit by bit, and um, that's a fantastic achievement.
in the, in the main in German-speaking countries. You get what is called a Wunderkabinett, a cabinet of wonders. They would be a substitute, in, set, in a sense, for the wonders which navigators and sailors would come across. But their superiors in the society, uh, princes and the owners of castles, would not have the opportunity, generally speaking, to see, because they went abroad on the main in boats which were hardly twice the size of this room. And so they wouldn't risk their own lives traveling, rather relatively lower persons, very often half demented, who would go off venturing on the Spanish main to see these places. But they would not be unwise enough to venture forth. Rather, they kept a place like this to remind them of the uh, curious nature of the world with this cabinet of curiosities. Now this has the uh, few treasures I've been able to amass. And uh, they are all here for my delectation. I've always felt that one's relation to treasures should be such that one can take them out and uh, look at them. This is a cat which I bought from the Museum of London, the London Museum, allegedly with his collar and many of his whiskers still intact, again from the Black Death. <clears throat> and he is dried out nicely and has an eloquent face. Huh. This is some of the stone from which Cluny is built, from the quarries in Cluny. And that is a piece of the Berlin Wall. When it was demolished, I was there, and I took a souvenir with me back. And this is a German figure of death, I find my favourite view is that, with an hourglass, an hourglass, there he is, surveying everything, a honeycomb with a dead squirrel on it, because the squirrel had been uh, greedy enough and unfortunate enough to get into the hive without being able to get out before he was stung to death. And so he died, and they went on building the honeycomb over him. This is the centre of a Roman shield found in the garden. And this is amber, of course. Comes from petrified wood. There's some good amber in here. And this comes from the, the mountains of Morocco. And this is a piranha fish, as you know. From the Amazonas. All of these things here are refugees from the world. All of them. I would say it's probably the hardest uh, work that I've ever undertaken. It's because of evaluating the changes or anticipating the changes that are going to not happen in five or ten, it's in 15 and 20 years' time and try to read what, what those changes will mean. And it required the screen to be designed so that it could shrink inwards. And it is in fact six inches less in width or 150 mil narrower than it was originally laid out. They dried vertically outside of the workshop and after about five years, we took them into the abbey and the conditions in the abbey were perfect. And whilst the carving was taking place, each piece was taken away and brought back. And in that time, seven, nine years, I think, over that period of time, the screen dried out. 
I mean, I look out from the library window and I look across at the ruins of the abbey, the dissolution, and the amount of stone, the volume, the volume of material, the height, the size of it. These were, these these buildings were just beyond belief, really. Um, they were miracles in a sense, and there's the commitment of the craftsmen, and that's where. I touch with them. That's what the Abbey does to me. It makes me touch. I, it's almost as though I bridge across those centuries that are past and touch the hand of those monks that worked on the, on the Abbey. And that's, that's an honour. You know, as someone that works in wood, there's nothing better than to, 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 to feel that connection. I'll often take my lunch in the uh, ward garden and I can, I can sense the uh, spirit of the the guys who would uh, who have lived there in the past. And I feel that. And love the place very much. And the fact that it's been restored to such um, degree and care and, and, and all of the commitment of Devet to, to restore that building is remarkable. Being an artist, if it's not right, it'll hurt him. And it's the same for me. Uh, if it's not right, it hurts. But it's stretched me beyond any well beyond imagination in terms of cabinet work or in terms of working with wood all my work all my life has done that and it culminates now in the last the last library this is the last job probably that i will um because of its size i i shan't be working on any other work i solely work on this library now and that will be probably the end of my working life I live in this sort of uh, palazzo somewhere or other, probably in a country more like what I'm used to in South Africa. I live in this place, this palace, and I'm alone. Everybody I've known is dead, which has been predicted for me. I come from very long-lived people. I live there, surrounded um, by just servants and dwarves, probably like in Velazquez. Um, and uh, somebody said to me, well, Senor de Vet, all I see here in this palazzo are antiques and ancient portraits. Uh, nothing by you. And I believe that when you were younger, you painted pictures. And uh, I would then say to uh, the dwarves, uh, show him this guest. And squeaking and laughing and jumping about, the very muscular dwarves that have little bandy legs. They would, jumping, leave the room and I'd say, well, I'd follow them because they're going to show him. And uh, looking over their shoulders every now and then, they'd rush ahead and uh, press a number of parts of the wall, which would then roll up. And there'd be a staircase downwards, along, and upwards to another wall. And they'd rush down it and press the other wall again, and that would roll up in turn. And a vast room would be displayed, in which you would see candelabrum after candelabrum, into the distance. And on all the walls, there would be framed pictures, mine, but hidden in this room, to which you'd have to go only by being able to touch parts of the wall, which would enable it to open. And uh, I would say, yeah, it is. Yeah. And the man would say, but don't you display them? I'd say, no, uh, display and exhibition is repugnant to me. And. Uh, I said it is repugnant to many, but they have exhibitions due to want. And uh, I am lucky in that I, I do not need to, to display. And uh, a painter, a well-known painter, who was a friend of mine in Paris and who's now dead, said to me once, uh, Louis de Vette, tu vis toujours, 
des rentes. Mais tu ne gagnes jamais ta vie, même quand tu le gagnes. He said, you always live from a private income, Louis de Vette. And never for money you earn, even when you earn it. You live from a private income, for you are that sort of man. And that's perfectly true. That's what I'm like. I've always felt like a foreigner wherever I am. I felt like a foreigner in South Africa. I felt that I didn't know what my forebears had done to land me up in the southern tip of that bloody black continent. I, I mean, terrible. When I left the insurance society I used to uh, work for in order to keep body and soul together, because I broke from my parents when I finished school. And... Uh, I worked for three years in the legal and general insurance company in Johannesburg. And I used to sort the mail, being the lowest of the low. I used to sort the mail with a chap called Wally, who was black. And he was more or less my best friend. And after three years of being there, I got a scholarship to university by applying. I didn't know I could. And uh, when I left legal and general, Wally, this black man, said to me, I wish I could come with you. <laughs> it upsets me even now. It upsets me. I never saw him again. But when you're younger, you're, you're more negligent of the things that really should bind you. I should have held to Wally. I should have gone and seen him again. I should have gone back. The seeking of man, desolated through no matter what, for this ideal of beauty and ownership, to be able to clasp a beautiful thing which you absolutely own because you've somehow paid for it, and it is yours. It is so beautiful, man. This is the whole basis of collecting. This is what collecting means that you've paid for it, it is utterly yours. And if it costs a lot, then it's so much the more precious. This is the meaning of capitalism, of, of ownership. You know. I feel I'm working on the on the very edge of my ability on this and part of it is at the vet's suggestion of, of, of techniques which I didn't even think I can do. The number of times the vet suggested can we have this, could we carve this and I, and I go oh no 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 and uh, then you think, and I think, well, how can I do it? Um, and you think it simply isn't possible. And then you find yourself doing it. Well, maybe it's just possible. And then you've done it, and it looks marvellous.
it is a wonderful place for contemplation and for coming face to face with your inadequate self, this place. It is exactly like that, and it is totally, totally appropriate for somebody of my temperament. That's why I got hold of it, and with my wife's help, managed to hold on to it. I've never understood this dislike that a lot of artists have for money. I think that if you have a, a rigorous morality, which I have, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I think that most of the people waste their time far too much and all the rest of it. If you have that, and you also have money, you can really then build something enduringly beautiful to which peop young people are attracted for study and to learn about happiness, about fulfillment, self-fulfillment in life. I've often felt that I've lost my real vocation in life, which was to teach young people how to enjoy themselves. I enjoy being surrounded by a coherent theology and um, I actually adore it, I love it, but I don't necessarily myself personally believe in it. And I put in the statue of the Madonna and child with the crucified Christ on the back. Um, they come from uh, Burgundy, not far from Cluny. And I felt that I had to assert the relationship of this place to Cluny. And that's one of my ways of asserting it. Why I am so attached to Cluny and to this attachment it has with Cluny, I don't really know why, except that I, I very much endorse it. I mean, there have been times in this house when I've received a gas bill and I knew we couldn't possibly pay for it, uh, where I've taken the, the actual bill to the, the altar and said, you know, help me. And what has contradicted my rather faithless attitudes is that I've always been helped. And I want God to know, you know, hear me about it, that I've always believed that I've been helped. But help thou my unbelief. I would say that I'm an agnostic he is a disappointed believer. I would far, far rather that I believed, but I don't. I am disillusioned. I have prayed for the ability to believe, but that that not just be crass stupidity on my part, but actually founded on some set of clues and I've said to God in my imagination come on show me show me something convincing help me but I have had nothing but silence from the other side When I was a boy, my father, when I was about 10 or 11, gave me a pellet gun, rather a nice one, which you broke in half and put the pellets in, you know? And I went up on the hills above where I lived, in Pretoria, which is the capital of South Africa. Um, I got up onto the top of there and I saw a little bird and I shot it. I ran over to the bird, 
I picked it up and I held it in my hand and it expired in my hand, it just died. I've never got older over that, ever. Never. The most awful, terrible sight. And I took the gun back to my father and I said, take it back, I never want to see it again. And my father said, have you no gratitude? I'll beat you so the bloody blood runs, you understand, you little bastard? But I stuck to it. I've never touched a gun since. Do you know, it must be well over 50 years ago that that happened, 70 years probably, or something like that, 50, 60, I don't care to calculate it. I'm still not over it. I'm not over it. You know, I think about it at times, I weep. Yeah. Little bird, all it had was this little love. Yeah. And I bloody finished it. That stupid gift of my father's. And his father, my grandfather, took me behind his farmhouse when I was 10 to show me what he had kept for 40 years there. The blood of English soldiers that had been wounded by him in the Boer War. And he dragged round the back and shot them against the wall. And he said, never forget. Well, I never have, but what I've remembered is not what he wanted me to remember. Yeah. And I married to an English woman. For what I know, relatives of hers were firing away at relatives of mine. How stupid. Yeah. But it seems to me that Mandela is a far wiser man than most of the whites. <laughs> you know, the Reformation, the Italian Renaissance, all the rest of it. What has it led to? Us. You compare Mandela, who's had none of that. And yet... I don't really know how I paint a picture or how the images evolve. Uh, they simply do. They rise up like so much rack from the sea. They rise up mysteriously, stay there for a while before sinking finally back into the sea. Well, my work is very influenced by the Memento Mori tradition in medieval Europe, the dance of death, the problem of mortality. In a small church in France, not far from Paris, called La Ferté Loupière, there is a dance of death with skeletons cavorting about. And underneath it says, in medieval French, Quand mourir faut, c'est grand contraintes. When it is necessary to die, it is a great limitation. I have been influenced all my life by these frescoes of La Ferte Lupierre and plenty of other memento mores. The important thing about a painting is how well it's done. Forget about false ideas of genuineness or this is not a, a genuine devet or genuine this or that. It doesn't matter. What really matters is the intrinsic quality of the painting, of the actual paint in it. It's got to be good paint. It's got to be well drawn, well painted. And if it's that, that's all that matters. Nothing else matters. You can't actually define it unless you've got the thing in front of you and then you can see what is spiritually a good picture or not. Because it stands out, I mean, it's obvious. It absolutely stands out. I saw paintings of the École de Paris, in other words, the School of Paris, in South Africa. They had an exhibition in South Africa. It was my first sight of French contemporary painting. And it changed my life. It had a deep influence on me. I never got over it. Some of it's so beautiful, 
They were early Bernard Buffets on it. His early days, wonderful paintings. In fact, if one took all the influences on my work of painters and writers, the list would, would be a considerable one. Because I do not believe that originality is due to the fact that you're the first to do something. I don't believe that. I think that originality, generally speaking, is a different combination of influences in such a way that you see a typical style as different from what you had thought thitherto it was. This is uh, one of the pictures I would fain have had back to hang in my own house. Uh, I often think that um, a beautiful woman is the more beautiful for some small defect in something superficial like her makeup. And this was the case here. I think that she has a well nigh perfect face to me. The tender father I would have liked to have had. Of course, uh, the title is somewhat uh, misleading. Instead of the skull, the bony skull, being inside the flesh, it's on the outside, uh, the skull. And it is a sort of armor through which he looks, through the skull, at other people. And there's nothing really tender about him. But I think it's one of the best pictures I've ever done. And I also think it has a, a nobility about it, in my opinion. Now, to me, the ultimate aim of art is, and it sounds very pretentious to put this, but it's not meant so, because my work has fallen always short of this. It has not succeeded in this. But to create something so beautiful that it turns the beholder to stone and thus destroys the impression one has continually in mortal life of the passing of time. Time ceases in the gaze of Medusa. And the purpose in art is to stop time passing, which is linked with death and with mortality, to stop time passing and to live in a sort of eternity locked in the gaze of Medusa. This to me is the underlying, or one, one of the ways of putting the underlying motivation for art.